I'm delighted to see you all. My name is Satohiro Akimoro, Chairman and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I'd like to offer welcome to the ambassadors who are attending today. Ambassador Romardes of the Philippines, Ambassador Aung Lin of Myanmar, Ambassador Zakios of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, welcome. I'd also like to welcome Ambassador Aikawa and Minister Ida from Japanese Embassy. I also have two uh, uh, executive director from Sasakawa uh, Peace Foundation Tokyo attending this event, Ms. Junko Chano and Dr. Atsushi Tsunami. Welcome. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA is 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening understanding of strengthened ties between the United States and Japan, mainly focusing on diplomacy and security in the Asia Pacific context. In that regard, we have a wonderful speaker today, Dr. Nobuhiro Aizawa, or Nobu, is an associate professor at the Kyushu University. He is currently a Japan scholar at the Wilson Center with the support of Sasagawa Peace Foundation Tokyo. He specializes in ASEAN politics, ASEAN countries, and geopolitics of the region. He also holds a position at the Naval Analysis and the SAIS. We have equally interesting, and I didn't use the word interesting lightly, uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Satu Limai. Satu uh, is no stranger to everybody in this virtual room. He doesn't need any introduction. He knows the issue and the area very well. He has high energy and he has a unique intellectual perspective. So I'm really excited to have uh, Nobu and Satu uh, for this event. Thank you very much for joining. Good morning. I have taken a look at uh, uh, Nobu's uh, presentation outline, and he has many interesting points. And he just told us in the green room that he sort of uh, reorganized the uh, uh, presentation. So we'll see how it goes, but uh, there are some interesting points. But from the viewpoint of uh, myself, I'd like to just touch upon the two uh, uh, issues that I'm interested in. First, uh, in Washington, when we talk about Asia, we tend to talk about Asia from the viewpoint of US-China bilateral point of view. And it is only natural and maybe logical because historic ascendance of China is the biggest challenge that everybody in this room faces in at least in the first half of this century. Having said that, the United States is stronger, effective, and more eff uh, attractive if it works with the uh, allies. Japan is one of the largest allies, if not the largest uh, ally of the United States in Asia. And Nobu is going to bring Japan back into the argument. Secondly, when we talk about uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific in Washington, we often start talking about it uh, uh, with the viewpoint of uh, Quad, namely the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. But whenever I heard the word Quad, I said to myself, where are the ASEAN countries? Where are the Pacific Island nations? After all, they are sitting in the middle of the region and at the center of the Quad. So I'm really excited to have uh, uh, um, Nobu and Satu to this event. As Shanti said, this is on the record. We're going to provide detailed uh, memo after the event. So with that, uh, Nobu, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Satohiro-san, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the session, and thank you very much all for joining the session. Um, I'm very delighted to be in DC. Um, I'm, just to uh, add some self-introduction, I have been um, work, doing research on Southeast Asia for the past 20 years. I started my research following Southeast Asia overseas Chinese community and China, those triangular relationships. And then I do research, I did research on Japan Southeast Asia relationship. And now I'm here to study US Southeast Asia relationship. So that's the, the way, that's how I was brought into DC and thanks to everybody being able to have a strong discussion. And I wanna share um, from that experience, starting a Japanese 
researching Southeast Asia in DC. So therefore, I have, I have to share maybe two questions that I always have in my mind. Um, one is, of course, Japan's relationship with Southeast Asia. Um, clearly, its relationship is at the crossroads. Um, old relationship with Japan and Southeast, Southeast Asia was so successful, but it's gradually being outdated, I must say. Um, but the Japanese are now in the stage that we have to survive in the aging society with the challenge of a new geopolitical situation, which is exactly the rise of China or more even assertive China. And, and with this, Southeast Asia is becoming ever more critical for Japan. So the old relationship is becoming outdated, but it's getting more important. So how are we going to transform? That's the basic question, the first question I always have. Second question for United States too. Now I understand the US-China relationship, relationship is very much the primary strategic goal of for, uh, foreign relationship in the uh, United States. But of course, um, before this COVID-19 crisis, the US re relationship with Southeast Asia was not in an ideal position. The president could not take his time to join the EAS and also the uh, US ASEAN summit was canceled. Well, that was unfortunate, but that was not the situation that US would like to go back. Everybody talks about back to normalcy, but that's not the normalcy I think the US want to go. But yet, the more the relationship with China uh, sharpens, I think it's very logical to consider the enhanced importance of Southeast Asia. But how are we going to get there? Um, that's the second question. Being in DC, I always have been thinking about. But let me share my way of dealing with this question. Um, I may not have a clear answer to both of the questions, but let me share how I approach this. Um, because I have started with the Southeast Asia specialist, I always look up on how Southeast Asia see this great power relationship. Um, this is the basic approach that I will always uh, think. And looking at every possible challenges, issue, um, my assumption, the, the most important assumption that I will take from Southeast Asia is this. Um, Southeast Asia is now in a hurry to grow because Southeast Asia do not think the time is on their side. Why? Why do they think the time is ticking? It's because they are getting old before getting rich. I know that I have a bias, a little bit of bias on the uh, middle range countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand, and maybe slightly Vietnam. So maybe this assumption does not match with Singapore or with Laos, but I do have an assumption that Southeast Asia's primary challenge in the question is they need to, they need to grow rich before they get old. All of the political decision, I would, I will root it in that assumption first. They do not want to be like Venezuela. Like Venezuela in 2013, they went to like $19,000 per capita, but now it went down. So there are precedents that fails. So Southeast Asia is cautious and they wanted to do every decision possible to avoid that um, in, a, in a casual uh, language, to avoid the middle income trap but it's not gonna be easy, especially when we know that this COVID-19 crisis has hit hard. It's not gonna be easy. So that's where I start my analysis. So, um, but that, uh, let me share some um, slides here. So if we take a look at this, um, my understanding is that the dependency ratio is the key. You, you can't have high dependency ratio to be able to overcome the in, uh, middle income trap. So if this shows the elderly dependency ratio of 0 0.25, you can't go, you have to grow to say, for example, 20,000 before the elderly dependency ratio goes. So that's the time taking, and it will approximately take another 15 to 20 years. So it's not too long to be to get there. 
So that's the kind of time range that I will see in understanding Southeast Asian politics. If you look at the whole um, picture here, I think the most critical part is the Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, um, those countries, whether they could go to a aging mid-income markets so that the Southeast Asia as a whole be prosperous. I think that will kind of understand, that's the dynamics that the Southeast Asia will have. And if all the um, economic theory that we have, um, this phase in the um, advanced middle income phase, whether there is a massive institutional upgrading at this phase from 4,000 GDP per capita to 20,000 GDP per capita, this is the moment when they need their international relation or foreign relationship to make it right. So for Southeast Asia also, this is the moment when their relationship with countries like United States, Japan, and also China matters most. But of course, um, this is not the only uh, logic that defines Southeast Asian politics. Another one is that Southeast Asia's growth per se, um, their income growth is, has been growing this past 20 years. So Southeast Asia for sure is a region of growth. Um, this chart shows that every 10 years, how much have they grown? So from 1998 to 2008, uh, it shows how much it grow. It's over um, 129, which means 29% more um, and above. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 20 years or a generation of growth. So there are many population who are expecting a better life, better life than their parents. So as a political theory says, every country has to manage that expectation. The rise of expectation of the people has to be met. And if it fails, the politics will not destabilize. That's one thing. But if we look at carefully, there is a trick here. So if you compare the difference between 1998 to 2000 and 2008 to 2018, actually the growth is slowing. Um, the red numbers that I marked, which says the minus, means that the 10 year growth from the previous year, uh, from uh, the 10 year growth is slower than the 10 year before then. So what this means is the current time of the people may not feel that they are doing better than the people that were flourishing 10 years ago. They are in absolute growth, but they're feeling relative frustration. So that frustration always also influences Southeast Asian politics in every country. So there is two things. Growth leads to expectation. Politics has to meet this expectation. Second, there is also frustration. Politics has to address this frustration. And adding to that, what Southeast Asian is facing is rising inequalities. It's not just a slowdown compared to 10 years ago, but also a widening inequalities. This will lead to a social polarization. There is a absolute growth, but the people's feeling more of a frustration. And therefore, there are very big difference who thinks the past 20 year was a really nice year and the past one year was a terrible year, which leads to difficulty in creating consensus, difficulty in making agreements. And with all the digitalization and also the social media, the gap and the polarization is just sharpening. That is exactly why many Southeast Asian countries are having tough time in managing politics. So what they will end up is two things. 
One is illiberal democracies. So they will go with democ democratic system. They will count on the frustration of the left behinds and they will win the election, take power, and they will side with the people. That's one way. The other side is you, you give up making a, an agreement in a polarized society. So you either uh, go for an authoritative rule. The prime example is Thailand. They endorse coup and welcomes coup because they consider the difference in how they see the society is difficult. It's impossible to reach agreement through a democratic process. Now, this is what's going on this the past 20 years in Southeast Asia. And I would like to uh, put the foreign relationship here. With this situation, both for illiberal democracies or perhaps liberal authoritarians, China is serving their best partner. For illiberal democracies, it is logical to consider these liberal democratic leaders really needs to attack the elites because the elites are the wealthy 1% or 10% that sees the past 20 year as a victory and also sees liberal democracy as the scheme for their sustainable power holding. But the people who put the leadership into the leadership do not see that. They think the liberal is the enemy for them. It's the liberal that made their social mobility stop. So what they will demand is they want to um, alter these power base. So what they mean to alter the power base is the old traditional elite network, which could be related to Japan and United States will be concurrently attacked and the new leadership will look for a new international power base. And China will be a very suitable partner to fill in that position. I think maybe it's too early to say, but the recent case, for example, in the Philippines about the broadcasting, broadcasting station closing down, Duterte is closing down a broadcasting system, uh, station, which is owned by a very well-known uh, traditional elite might be altered to a new elite that has a very good connection with China. That's a logical or hypothetical understanding, but the similar situation is happening in Indonesia, in, in Malaysia, in Thailand as well. You will see all these elite right-hand men becoming the very best supporter of the new leader who side with the people, like Jokowi's Luhut is prime example as such. Of course, the other side, uh, for the military side or the authoritarian side too, when they need to make sure those um, authoritarian rule of governance being the solution for a polarized society, they also need a international support. But of course, that's not the favorable way to govern from the US or from the Japanese point of view. So they will need a international endorsement. And that, in that case also, uh, China will serve as the best partner, like Thailand. Um, Prayut, right-hand man, Prawit, is also the right-hand man or a gatekeeper for China too. So all in all, um, I can, I can um, sh uh, share with you what China is doing. But the important thing here I want to share is that there is a very good reason, a social dynamic that invites China in to form formulating in a new elite system in Southeast Asia. So now, if we understand this dynamic, I think the challenge for Japan or United States is clear. Well, forget, um, just to make, just to clarify, the Chinese point of view for Southeast Asia is also very clear. Chinese wants, um, Chinese already, the Yan Jiechi, uh, Foreign Minister Yan Jiechi in 2010 already said about how China, uh, China is a big country, Southeast Asian countries are small, 
And also Chinese needs to make the political economic ecosystem of the region conducive to what Chinese uh, greatness in 2049. What that mean is basically uh, China needs the uh, neighboring countries to be um, in a position that will never be able to undermine any Chinese political decision making. So you will use every part of the geopolitical or the technological superiority in making that happen. And even more, uh, it's not only about China, but it's also about the Communist Party rule. So uh, as my friend in Thailand told me, that Chinese um, target is to make Southeast Asia a one party govern country region. It's not a democratic region or a one party state region. So that's the ultimate uh, strategy that China wants. But so, um, but it does have a very good combination what the Southeast Asian elites needed and what China's offering. So to understand the challenges for Japan and United States in making their um, strategies and, and the foreign policy ahead, I want to share what Japan is for, uh, what for Japan's point of view. So first, um, Japan, I would say, is a de facto ally of Southeast Asia. Um, of course, Japan has a weakness of its own, especially because of the stagnant economy. Japan is not as strong an economy as it was 20, 30 years ago, but the Japanese commitment to Southeast Asia is growing. Japanese domestic market is not growing um, in, a, in a high pace, just 2% or 1%, but the Japanese investment to Southeast Asia is growing. It's not it's, it's about the past, it's what it's currently happening too. And it's outpacing the other countries in the region too, uh, which is US, China, and South Korea. Also, um, um, the, from the Japanese point of view, it is very clear that um, ASEAN is a bigger target compared to China. Well, China enjoyed the Japanese investment in the late 2000s, but now the trend is reversed. And also the Japanese FDI to Southeast Asia is going into a broad event. And it's not only about coal oil, coal, oil and natural gas, but also in every part of the economy. Like Southeast Asian FDI to other Southeast Asia is dominantly on real estate. Chinese investment is dominantly on metals and rare earth, but the Japanese FDI is very broad. So it's very much intertwined in Southeast Asian economy. And about the more details, um, it is very clear that Thailand is the center of Southeast Asian investment. While of course, Myanmar, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia is also uh, growing and Vietnam as the biggest um, accelerating growth destination. Um, the Japanese, is also very unique in the sense that there are Japanese residents. If you look at two, um, 2000, the changes between 2012 to 15 to 18, the Japanese moving to Southeast Asia is growing in a very fast pace. It's a much faster pace than the Japanese demographic change per se. I would say the Japanese in Japan is becoming less, the Japanese in Southeast Asia is growing. Or even I could say Japanese in China is moving to Japanese in Southeast Asia. This is a very big political constituency of itself. I can tell you one episode here about Thailand, for example. In 2014, Thailand had a political coup. And of course, the Tokyo government condemned the Thai, Thai, Thai government of this unconstitutional power shift. And Japan was ready to criticize, to condemn with more, more policy implications. Those who objected to those Tokyo move was the Japanese in Bangkok. They are now a big constituency on its own that could also reshape the Tokyo policy too. 
So that's how big it is. Japanese investment is not just a one sector or a portfolio investment. It's a greenfield multi-sector investment together with a Japanese resident, which means their interest is very much aligned with the Southeast Asian growth, ra even rather than the Japanese growth. So Japanese is unique in that sense. Japanese, from a Southeast Asian point, there is two Japan. Japan in the Japanese archipelago and Japan, J Japan in the Southeast Asian region. This really gives a different policy option for Southeast Asia and also for Japan, it will be a bridging community to um, adjust or to arrange a relationship among the two regions. Um, number two, um, what the Japanese has been doing, also there is a political will to reconnect or transform the two regions as well. I think you might have known the Japanese Prime Minister Abe in his second term, the first year of second term, he visited 10 Southeast Asian countries in single year. This is a high standard that the Japanese Prime Minister said. I'm not sure how long will he still be in power, but every Prime Minister followed, following uh, Prime Minister Abe will be, always be tested in this high standard. This is an unprecedented situation, but this is a bar that Prime Minister Abe has set, and it's a very, very strong commitment for Southeast Asian countries. Um, the other point, what Japanese has been doing with Southeast Asia. Well, of course, everybody knows Japan has lost a lot of high profile infrastructure projects, but Japan really focused now on a urban development. Japanese commitment to urban developments like the subways or intra-city transportations, also a, a series of um, disaster relief um, infrastructures, all these enhancing the livability of the urban sector is very much prioritized. Well, of course, it, this is not just because the Japanese are living in Southeast Asia only, but the model that Japanese wants to share with Southeast Asia is this urbanized Asia. If you look at the statistics, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot to explain to this to you. Um, this is one type of Japanese FDI results. Um, nowadays, Japanese community in Southeast Asia is an incubator for Japanese innovation for small and medium enterprises. These are a restaurant or fintech company that had been founded by a Japanese and a Thai duo. You know, both are very popular fintech and, and a, uh, uh, restaurants. So this is a type of a new wave of Japanese innovation. Japanese innovation is not happening in Japan, but even more so in Southeast Asia and, and widely, not only in Thailand, but also, of course, in um, Singapore, but also in Manila and, and Jakarta as well. And these have led to the favorability rate that Japan has been enjoying for the past two decades or so. Uh, let me skip this um, here. Um, uh, let me jump to one thing here. Yes, urbanization. I wanted to share about the urbanization. So the urbanization is another trend that Southeast Asia will not be able to avoid and has to face. Um, with this COVID-19 crisis also, the urbanized society has a unique uh, social, social policy that has to be enhanced. And this is where uh, Japan has been working for the past 10 years as well. The reason is very simple, because Japan is the only country that can be matched in scale. Um, look at cities, mega cities like Jakarta or Manila. Those are like 25 million plus cities. Which example can they derive their governance model from? Tokyo and Yokohama zone is more than 35, close to 40. These are the examples. How can a central government together with local government can deal with you know, waste management, flood uh, ma ma management, earthquake, typhoon, you name it. You, we, we share, Southeast Asia and Japan share a lot of climate change, natural disaster threats. So we share the same urban structure of growth, but at the same time, we share these threats 
So there are many uh, policy policy fields that we are now aligned to. So our approach to Southeast Asia was seemingly considered being hindered by China due to this high profile, high speed trains and so forth. But on the ground, if we look at it, we have much more important project that we are continuing to work. And so these are the, the basis of our continued um, strategy and continued uh, shared governance. And, and lastly, um, one thing I wanna share is this one. So another new field that Japan is now looking for Southeast Asian cooperation is the space. Well, the space competition, of course, is ultimately between United States and China. That is a very, um, I think there's a consensus to it. But Japan also has a very unique position because of its geographical location. The Japanese um, new satellite like Michibiki has a, a route of its course that goes, covers Japan together with Southeast Asia and Australia because of its location. So this is where Japanese system enhancement also be able to shared by Southeast Asia, which is happening. So this is the, um, the GPS system is also uh, in harmonized with the Japanese system. And this has been made a basis of agriculture enhancement, fisheries, and also most importantly, um, urban transportation. So this is the kind of the social platform that Japan needs to be sharing with Southeast Asian, especially in the mega cities and key industries like agriculture and fisheries. And this is where Japan is currently geared up to with Southeast Asia. So the key is, be it there is a changing patterns of uh, more assertive China, or there are internal difficulties of Japanese aging society or polarized society in Southeast Asia. Japan and Southeast Asia share this common goal to make our society resilient. Resilient in enhancing our technological advancement or in mitigating a lot of risks. So this is where um, Japan is now at. So how about the United States? So for the United States, I think it's very clear. The US strategy in principle is pretty much the same for this path. 30 years or so, I was looking at the past um, comments of like Jim Baker or um, the time of uh, Clinton era. I think Republican uh, government and, and Democratic government all share the notion of their strategy principle for Asia is to prevent any single hegemonic power. And it's the same today. So if that is the principle, I think the the answer is very clear. Um, um, let me see. So if this, if this is the principle, I think um, the US uh, policy priorities have now need to be shifted into um, Southeast Asia. Why? Because of our new style of politics. Um, this is the next section. So I think the, with the COVID-19 crisis, what we are learning is that our politics of platform and standards are now ever more increasingly important. For example, the defense system, the US defense system of a forward, um, uh, you know, forward deployment, you know, uh, defense strategy will not going to be there for a long period. It will be more of a, what, what was it called, a, a mosaic strategy, or it will be um, considered as more on a cyberspace. I think that is the trend. But of course, those cyberspace and all these um, mosaic theory, we need standards to cooperate. And that standard setting in Asia will be defined by what Southeast Asia chooses. Of course, China has one say and US has another. Um, if Southeast Asia tilts toward China, 
what will be the Japanese choice? Will Japan choose United States at the expense of China and Southeast Asia? That's a very tough choice to make when you look at how Japan and Southeast Asia is socially intertwined. Japan really needs to intertwine, uh, is already intertwined, and that is exactly the reason why Japan and Southeast Asia has to share the standards, and that standard has to be conducive to what United States is promoting. The GPS and the Michibik system is one prime example. Um, it's ultimately the GPS standards with the uh, Beidou system in China, but the Japanese Michibiki system is the way to enhance the GPS system in the region, not just in Japan, but also Southeast Asia and Australia. Um, you want the centimeter accuracy, you need the Michibiki system. GPS has a meter accuracy, but if you want a centimeter accuracy, you need the Michibiki system. So with these kind of alliances, we'll set the standards, which standards Southeast Asia could benefit from. And I will, I would like to give you one example that needs attention. Um, and during everybody was coping with the COVID-19, there was a very important decision in the ITU, the International um, you know, Telecommunication Union um, in April. So China drafted a, a new um, suggestion of changing the TCP IP standard of the internet. So they wanted a new standard that all can monitor the who's and also they can have a shutdown button in their system. Well, of course, this is, this is in favor of an authoritarian rule, but not to the Japanese or uh, uh, United States open, open source innovation standard. But if we don't pay attention, you know, these ITU standards will be set as a standard which Southeast Asian countries needs to follow. And therefore, Japan and uh, United States will, will definitely be in the losing side. So that's a prime example that was happening behind everybody is focusing on the Medicare. So there must be a lot of attention in the standards setting in the platform competition in this region, especially to make Southeast Asia choose in a very harmonized way. I will um, make it short. Um, the other part that I would like to propose here is to make decentralization a standard of resilience too. As I told you about the rise of illiberal democracy or authoritarianism, I think the, another key is not is decentralization. It's not only about democracy or not, but it's the decentralization in this era for every country to be resilient. And that has been shown in major countries of big population like United States or Japan or Indonesia too. Every country is frustrated by their national leaders, but there are a lot of mayors and governors who raise their um, capabilities in governance who held their credit of democracy in their respective countries. And, and these mayors and governors could be considered as a resilient, as a force of resilience and also a new model of their governance style. And if we look at all these frustrations in every part of Southeast Asia, every expectation of the people that they wanted to flourish, these smaller pragmatic governance model will lead to a better credit. And, and that alliance, who gets that alliance might have a better network in a network society globally. The other part, the final part is the human capital. Um, there was this missed opportunity of US ASEAN summit in Las Vegas. And I heard that the main theme was the human capital enhancement. And I couldn't agree more on that one. If the Southeast Asian countries needs to go over the middle income trap, it's not only the foreign the, the direct investment, it's the enhancement of human capital. But the key is what kind of human capital that we should nurture. They have to be, of course, tech savvy, but of course also democratically, um, democratic minded, and also they put livability in a very high standard too, which means that they are 
sensitive to a lot of environmental impact and so forth. So what kind of people, and everybody understands Southeast Asia needs more enhanced human capital, but what kind of human do we, as not only every country, but we as a collective international community wants to nurture, I think that will be defined very much in a good cooperation. And I think United States with a very good high education institution, which is one of the biggest asset in, in the United States, will be able to make a difference in this um, decades ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Nobu, uh, for your insightful, original, and uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. It's clearly uh, demonstrating uh, uh, your mastery of uh, uh, major issues in the region, and also uh, a dedication to the academic field of your choice. So thank you very much. And uh, um, Satu, uh, if you could uh, provide your commentary to uh, an observation to uh, 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 Nobu's uh, presentation. Thank you. Sure. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to Sasagawa USA and Sasagawa Foundation. As you uh, well know, many of you who are joining us today, the East-West Center has had a long relationship, a very productive and constructive relationship with Sasakawa uh, Foundation in both Tokyo and in Washington. And therefore, I'm delighted uh, to uh, be invited to join this program. Um, we've done many projects together and, and look forward to doing many more. Uh, look, I want to just first of all congratulate uh, uh, Nobuhiro Aizawa-san, um, who is sort of my a mentor on learning about Southeast Asia because he really is a rigorous and uh, deeply thoughtful scholar. So I, I have learned a lot from his presentation and his approach uh, to the issues. I've been given about seven minutes, so until about 10.50, to make a few comments and observations which cannot possibly address the really rich and deeply um, empirical and thought-based uh, presentation that Nobu has just given us. So let me uh, start out with big issues. First is the premise of the presentation, which is the challenge of Southeast Asia's uh, transition to middle income. Now, I'm not an economist by training, um, but I, in reading the preliminary notes and hearing Nobu. And um, my own sense is that the focus on the dependency ratio and demographic issue is probably in my judgment a little overweighted in, in Nobu's analysis. This is not to deny the empirical realities of the demographic, demographic shifts in, in countries in the region um, because those are empirically verifiable. But it is to raise another alternative view, which the middle income um, transition literature, particularly the St. Louis Fed study in 2018 on middle income transition suggests, which is that um, policy choices matter a lot. And the policy choices particularly revolve around three sets of issues, uh, traditionally to transition. Um, and this was not, unevident in the, uh, uh, you know, Asia and the miracle report of the early 90s by the World Bank as well, which is one is um, labor intensive light industry transition in urban areas. The second was um, a focus on reform in the agricultural sectors, both to make it productive, but also to introduce uh, some manufacturing into the rural sector. Um, and the third was, for the lack of a better word, and you know, uh, Nobu spoke to this quite a lot, human capacity and human cap capital development, which means everything from primary literacy to vocational and technical education to move up the value chain uh, to escape the middle income trade. Now, my own sense is, um, therefore, that I would suggest that those policy reforms are uneven across Southeast Asia deeply uneven across mm. Southeast Asia, That's right. yeah. which is as much an explanatory variable as is the dependency ratio. That's true. The second comment I would make in this starting point relates to the issue of exogenous versus endogenous factors, which is much of the analysis that Nobu has given us focus on domestic developments. And those are true. There's no question that those are at least half the package, if not more. 
But I would suggest that we are entering a time when exogenous factors are likely to be doubly disadvantageous to transitions for middle income trap, unless very, very carefully navigated and maneuvered. Mm -hmm. Why is that a point I'm making? Because we are somewhere in the middle distant horizon between decisions about supply chains, regional fragmentation, national-based uh, privileges, uh, controls on immigration, um, deglobalization. You can call it whatever you want. I, I, I don't, you know, people use different terms, fragmentation of supply chains, diversion of supply chains. But my own sense is that a certain amount of this is going to happen. I don't know if it's 10%, if it's 50 percent mm. uh, but it's going to happen and yes. this leaves southeast asia in particular in a very vulnerable spot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the domestic political economies of the unevenness in which supply chain benefits that is to say uh per capita gdp increases refract domestically so uh -huh. who gets the benefits of these is really going to shape what political choices are made. Mm -hmm. And in some of these descriptions that uh, Nobu put out, uh, authoritarianism, uh, illiberalism, boy, they could strike me as Eastern Europe. One might, one might turn to other countries to think about some of the similar features of what's happening, uh, whether in South Asia or elsewhere. So they don't seem unique to me to Southeast Asia. But mm -hmm. I think that combination of reform rather than dependency ratio and the very turbulence we're entering into where Southeast Asia essentially benefited from global supply chains and globalization are at their peak. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they will be fundamentally disruptive, but they are likely to be deeply dis disruptive. And I don't know, because that also affects, and I'll come back to that on standards. Um, and I would just say, Nobu, here as a, as a statistical and methodological point, uh, I would, in your next analysis, um, introduce EU more, because I think the EU is quite important here um, okay. to, for FDI and for, for, mm. for trade. The second issue is uh, Japan's role. Um, again, it is hard to uh, not concur with Nobu's, uh, you know, very subtle case about why Japan has privileged Southeast Asia over the last few years and how that continues to be the case. But I think Japan too is now going to enter a kind of difficult position on this because its supply chains and its approach to trade, et cetera, are going to have to tussle with these exogenous shocks of deglobalization, rerouting, uh, US pressures, Chinese pressures. Um, and one can see that in my mind a little bit um, in Thailand, which you spoke about as being the center of, of Japanese FDI and Japanese citizens, but choosing to still back off joining the CPTPPP. Mm -hmm. So, with, in other words, that nexus that we've taken for granted that Japan will be a major player and has been for 30 years a major player in Southeast Asia is now going to confront other pulls and pushes um, um, that I'm not sure all the countries in the region will respond in the way that Japan expects or hopes to respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Japan may, in fact, have to calibrate its policies in, with Northeast Asian neighbors in a way, I've been noticing uh, in the COVID response, to my mind, and someone on this call can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I've not seen any joint U.S.-Japan statement on Southeast Asia since COVID-19. But That's many true. of the calls that have occurred have been in the context of the ASEAN plus three. That's so right. one of the questions I have is, will Japan be constrained? or tilt towards a sort of Northeast Asian based response to Southeast Asia, meaning trying to keep those connections uh, going. So that's a second point. And the final point I'll end with, because my time is up, is, is to say that I take your um, very uh, subtle and, and 
and polite criticisms of U.S. policy. And uh, it's quite true, again, that uh, the president missed the opportunity and we missed the opportunity of the ASEAN summit. But I would suggest that the recent polling that you cite in your, in your presentation does give us hope that there are limits to how much uh, China in particular can move in the region. Even if acknowledged as the most influential political and strategic player and trade and investment player, the fact is, I think there are real limits to how much China can be seen as a reliable and welcome actor in the region. The same polls that show Chinese influence so massive also show uh, a quite significant uh, distrust or worry or lack of welcome about that growing influence. Mm -hmm. and, and, and similarly, um, just as Japan is most welcome in the region, and I'll end with this, 61% in the 2020 poll, 61.5% will do the right thing. As I go back to my original point, I think Japan will become more pressured to make choices about its relationship with the alliance with the United States and with like-minded allies and partners, which will maybe create more difficulties for Japan in the region um, as it mm -hmm. seeks to to navigate the U.S.-China um, dissonance. So let me end with that and, and, and again congratulate you for a really deeply stimulating uh, presentation, one with I will have to grapple and go back over some of those numbers and, and, and think through some more, but I, I will just end with those comments initially. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satu. Uh, uh, Nobu, would you like to respond to uh, Satu's comment? Yes, um, so uh, I can spend like 20 minutes, but just to, just a brief uh, response to it. The first one, yes, definitely, uh, uh, you know, the, the points that you raised was, is very fair. I, I need to get to a, a more statistical answer to that. So let me reserve that one. But the basic point is, I think, about the exogenous and indigen um, you know, uh, in endogenous. I think I, I really agree on that. And, and I think that is where we need to have a new kind of measurement, uh, a unit of analysis. That's mm. why I put, like, for example, urban or bringing the mayors back in matters here. It right. might not be the national that is the best choice of measurement for us to understand, for example, the, the growth or the productivity or the, um, the, all the elements that you have raised. So, um, and, and it could be, you know, it could be city, it could be mega city, it could be the city connections. Like you mm -hmm. see like Thai plus one, Thai plus one is not Thai plus Phnom Penh. Right. Or Bangkok plus Phnom Penh. It's Bangkok versus uh, plus the border zone. For example, right, right. right. Um, if it is an archipelago state, it, it's an, it's another thing. You know, it's like the you know it's a different. Everybody's trying to create a new unit of economy, mm -hmm. and that does not happen nationally, and that happens also with a foreign actors too. So I think our job, especially for an academic side, is to come up with a new unit of analysis that it captures. The, found, the foundation of what, it, what is indigenous, indigenous and exogenous. That's one um, response to that. Second point about Japan, I think that is, that's perfectly correct. Japan will be in, in, in the, at the crossroads. And I think you're right that Japan will be pressured because of the expectation too. Um, I think the trend is Japan is, well, Japan is going to change itself as one coalition partner. Um, used, Japan used to have this Japan, all Japan model, like whatever the political or whatever the economic, you, you kind of round up in a Japan team and mm. then pursue choices. But mm. I think that's the, the game of the past. Mm. At least you need Southeast Asian partner. If you want to do politics or business, for example, in Indonesia, you partner with Thai company, for example. Mm. Or you go to Vietnam together with Indonesian companies. I mean, I think partnering with Southeast Asia for another Southeast Asia is already becoming a de facto standard. And I think mm. whether Japan could be the partner of one, that's also a case. Another hybrid style is, for example, when we see this um, ODA model too, 
um, Japanese companies will not be tendering, but Japan can be on the design side, for example. Um, so the Southeast Asian country always have a choice between the, the project manager to the actual, for example, construction um, companies. Um, nothing has to be a one single country whole set relationship in this coming era. And I think that's where Japan's role will be more hybridized. Mm -hmm. um, that, will, that will be the choice because of the, the exact point that you mentioned about the political pressure. Um, it, it's not just about Japan, it's really about the team and how you team up will make the competition um, you know, go forward or backward. Third point about the United States, um, I mentioned about how much these, um, you know, uh, Southeast Asian internal domestic dynamics favors to China. But actually, we can argue that, for example, if the um, traditional elites are more into the Chinese network, this is the moment for the United States to come in, for example. For example, in the case of Cambodia or Laos or Myanmar, for example. Um, we, we can't forget that, you know, the first person to pledge um, to join the U.S. ASEAN Summit in Las Vegas was Prime Minister Hun Sen. And that tells a lot. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, that tells how they understand the dynamics. And if, for example, if Hun Sen wants to prolong his power, he knows what the different equation he needs to make or he needs to do. It's, it, it's a circulation, it's a, it's a circulation. So it's not like a one way for 20 years. It's more a, a cyclical, maybe even a shorter period, like three year shift. It's like a pendulum in every a large pendulum, small pendulum in every part. And the countries that will not miss that pendulum swing right. will grasp the you know, opportunity. I'm sorry, it's a metaphoric answer to your question, but- um, No, 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 you're, you're quite uh, right. I think you see this, yeah, you saw that in the Philippines with the online gambling decision by Duterte. Online gambling decision, and, that's and the correct. Virtual, yeah. And the real pushback. This is why I say the US has quite a lot of role if it run, if we choose to use it. Um, and if we choose to run with the, the, what I sense is the bandwidth for us to be more active, more engaged, uh, against sort of uh, narrow elites that are cozying up to other large uh, rivals in the region. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to turn to a question from the audience. We have a question from Ambassador David Shear, uh, former ambassador to Vietnam and uh, uh, chairman of uh, our National Association of Japan American Societies. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, thank you. In principle, the U.S. has said that we want to prevent the hegemony in Asia, but in practice, our strategic priority is on Southeast Asia. Do you believe that the Southeast Asia is more important strategically for Japan than it is for the United States? If so, what does this mean for Japanese interest? Is this a, a, a problem for Japan? And what more, if anything, should Japan do about it? Thank you very much, um, uh, Satohiro-san, and also Ambassador Shear. Um, yes, um, so the short answer is um, yes, uh, Southeast Asia is more important for Japan. That's, that's, I think that is very clear on that side. Um, when I was writing about the, uh, the 2014 coup in Thailand, um, that was like, uh, uh, Thailand for Japan is like, Egypt for Egypt for United States, for example. Um, it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, when, we, when I was comparing why in, in the Obama period, you know, one event was called a coup, one event was not. And if you look into the domestic politics of what are the, um, um, the principal uh, interests in the country, everything was laid out and everything was prioritized. And then when we see that, I think it was very, very clear that in Japan, um, the, the interest towards Southeast Asia is, is so much important. And especially with the trend right now, as I laid out, more companies are relying on Southeast Asia. Even more livelihood is important, uh, uh, um, 
is is now into Southeast Asia. I think uh, that that is the region that Japan cannot miss or make a mistake. Where else, you know, other parts certainly okay. Um, the only only thing for U.S. policy will be, I would say, a shift of an asset from Northeast Asia to, I mean, uh, North Korea to Southeast Asia. I think that will be a, a more important suggestion that I will say. Um, Northeast Asia, I mean, this I learned from my you know, um, colleagues in, in America. I don't know whether I, I should name it or not, but my good friend in, in Washington, D.C. have, um, you know, suggest me how important if we compare the importance of North Korea to, for example, Southeast Asia. Um, yes, North Korea is a threat to, um, you know, it, it's a military threat to United States, um, but in, in, in totality, I think the what's at stake with for example, the, the maritime geography from Taiwan to South more the United States as well. Um, so I'm not, I, it does matter how much the North Korea will take up the US political asset, but it is a very good time at this moment that some asset will be shifted to Southeast Asia. And especially if the case is is a, a, a preventing a hegemonic rise of China. Um, North Korean situation will not make a significant difference in the, in the whole equation of Asian power. But whether Southeast Asia chooses which standard, um, which platform, that defines a, a, a big um, leverage onto other countries, including South Korea and Japan as well. So um, because Japan's interest to Southeast Asia is much more important than for United States, if United States think Japan is important, I think to make Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian tie stronger, stronger will cement the triangle between US, Japan and Southeast Asia. And that will be a very strong trilateral re region to make, to prevent the hegemony. And every Southeast Asian country, as Satu has mentioned, does not want a hegemonic China or a hegem uh, Asia equals China type of um, regional structure. Uh, that is very clear. So there will, be, there will be maybe not as openly mentioned, but there will be a consensus in that regard. So that will be the case that I could make. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Ambassador Shear. Thank you. Uh, Satu, uh, do you have any uh, uh, response to uh, uh, David's uh, question or uh, Nobu's uh, uh, commentary on this one? Yeah, it's a, it's a, first of all, thank you, to, uh, Ambassador, uh, for the question. And, and I really appreciated Nobu's response, particularly uh, making the comparative case on North Korea. You know, it's quite interesting. And I think this shows you how much need there is for the US and Japan to talk about Southeast Asia um, more. Because we talk about China, we talk about Korean Peninsula, we talk about other areas. But I really want to make a pitch, as it were, a, a sort of advertisement for more discussion and dialogue between Americans and Japanese about Southeast Asia. And many of you will know that the, through the support of the Sasakawa Foundation, in Tokyo, we did a report called the US and Japan in Southeast Asia, meeting regional demands, where we sort of inverted the gaze and said, not what the US and Japan alliance can do in the region per se, but what does the region want the US and Japan to do together and separately? And while some of that is dated, particularly in the COVID context, some of it is not the fundamentals. And that brings me back to the point, I, I wanna make one point. Historically, traditionally, and I think geopolitically, Northeast Asia is where the game resets are exist in US policy in Asia. What do I mean? We have an alliance with Japan. We have an alliance with Korea. We have the Korean Peninsula issue. We have the Taiwan Straits. We have no similar geopolitical 
uh, commitments in Southeast Asia at the same level. So on one level, Nobu is quite right in pointing out the future importance of Southeast Asia. But from an American policy viewpoint, our engagement with Asia would fundamentally change if any of those flashpoints were to fundamentally change. Whatever the outcome, I'm not gonna to go to every scenario. It doesn't matter. What If those were to fundamentally change in one way or another, being resolved through peaceful negotiations, through collapse, whatever the case might be, that would alter the US vector into Asia. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Nothing in Southeast Asia would fundamentally change the vector of US engagement in Asia. Mm. But I quite concede, and in fact, have gotten into more into Southeast Asia, precisely because I believe you cannot deal with the China question without a more robust engagement with Southeast Asia. But nor can you take advantage of American leadership, American role in the wider world without drawing Southeast Asia's potential into the global mix. So on the one level in purely geopolitical, where the stakes, where the rubber meets the road, where conflict might occur, mm -hmm. it's still Northeast Asia all the time. Mm -hmm. But even that is beginning to become fuzzy. And if you look at the Marine Corps 2030 document, you can begin to see that all our services, all of our geopolitical, are paying more attention to Southeast Asia. And I return to my initial comments about the exogenous factors. If we are really on the cusp of some sort of diffusion, diversion, fragmentation, deglobalization, rerouting of supply chains, then Southeast Asia becomes more important too. So I, I'd make your case, but in a slightly different way from an American vantage point. Uh -huh. Okay, that, that's, that's fair, yeah. Thank you. We have a, a, a few minutes left, and uh, if I may, I'd like to exercise a, a moderator's uh, prerogative and ask him a noble uh, question. One of the difficulty of uh, uh, dealing with ASEAN uh, is the fact that uh, uh, you know there are many countries at uh, a different uh, development level and uh, are culturally diverse, uh, and it's loose uh, association. You mentioned uh, slowing uh, economic growth rate in ASEAN countries, as well as growing gap uh, uh, in ASEAN countries. You also touched upon increasing uh, a Japanese population in uh, ASEAN, you know, in relation to uh, uh, um, China. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what's the future of uh, ASEAN holds in your mind, uh, reflecting uh, economic changes, social changes that uh, uh, you mentioned? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Satohiro-san. So, um, Yes, I think that is the critical question, especially after this COVID-19, because the growth has been hindered. Um, so I think there will be a new set, uh, set of policy choices to be made. So it's not by the growth that, that creates political stability, but it's the, the word I use in my presentation, it's the livability in half. So the question will be, how do you make your life better without growing income? Mm. How do you make, you feel, make your people feel that your life is better without having a high pace of uh, income per capita? I think that's, that's where the role of government is going to be demanded, especially after this uh, pandemic crisis. For example, that could be about the hygiene, that could be about the mortality rate, that could be about, for example, um, you know, transportation system too. Um, that's where technological understanding and technological choices matters too. Um, it may not be your spending that defines, but it, it's becoming your, um, for example, like public transportation is better. So you don't have to own a car, but you have a much comfortable time of movement in your weekly professional engagement, for example. And that creates a better so-called life than your former generation who has a car, 
but is trapped into a traffic jam for four hours every day, for example. Um, now you don't own a car, but you have a better management of your time of your life. Maybe that is the type of government intervention to make people's expectation to meet. That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, as you mentioned, there will be a lot of differences between among the Southeast Asian countries, which if I look at the EU case, which makes it harder to even integrate. Mm. Uh, the EU had so difficult because of the disparity among the countries. Mm. And the disparity among the countries in Southeast Asia is even greater. Mm. And so uh, how would you be able to, for example, uh, to maintain the kind of um, integration makes a society better type of theorem. Um, that's where I think um, the type of in integration has to be changed because of this COVID-19 as well. Um, I don't have a clear answer yet, but I think the challenge is already obvious. Um, and this intra in intra country, intra region, you know, there's like three layers of uh, differences that needs to be adjusted and whoever comes with a good idea on that governance model it's good and Japan really has a good example of that low growth but a low mortality rate low homicide rate so it's safer for example and another thing that Japan was remarkable is that the, the kind of um, xenophobic um, xenophobic sentiment of nationalism was not as high as the same period that happened in Europe. For example, if we look at the Italy and the French statistics of growth, it is as low as Japan was in the same period. And if you look at the kind of social disharmony that they encounter with, of course, I'm, I'm comparing apples and oranges because Japanese immigration ratio is not as high mm. as Italy and Spain. It, it's not a perfectly fair comparison. But if you look at the Southeast Asian context, you, it's very critical that you need to ad understand the multi-ethnicity and multi-religious situation that doesn't create a huge fault line, social fault line in a low growth period. How do you do that? Invest on education, invest on healthcare. It's two things. Japanese did that two things, focused on two things, healthcare and education. If you keep your children educated and healthy, a lot of family will feel that you are within the society regardless of your ethnicity. I think the Japanese made a very costly but a very wise choice to invest on a certain public sector. And I think it's a low growth, but it's a good way for a government to intervene in keeping the social stability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one minute left and uh, it doesn't do justice, but uh, uh, Satu, uh, uh, I'll give you uh, uh, one minute for your one last word uh, before I close the event. I just say thank you. Thank you so much for um, organizing such a very interesting speaker in uh, Professor Nobuhiro Ayazawa-san. Uh, it's a delight to join you and I, I thank all those who joined us for this. And I hope we can, as I say, continue a discussion and dialogue on Southeast Asia because I think um, I share Nobu's uh, view that this will become increasingly important to both of our countries. Well, thank you very much. I uh, uh, realized that uh, uh, Nobu skipped uh, several slides and uh, uh, didn't touch upon uh, uh, some of the uh, talking points that he prepared. So uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, uh, invite Nobu back and uh, Satu back to continue our dialogue on this important uh, uh, issue. Uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, underserved in uh, uh, Washington. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to again thank you uh, for all the participants, uh, particularly uh, uh, represent a very strong representation from uh, Southeast Asian uh, embassies in Washington, uh, State Department people and uh, uh, Embassy of Japan, and uh, uh, two uh, executive directors from uh, Tokyo. This is uh, uh, past uh, midnight in Tokyo, but uh, thank you very much and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for joining and have a good day.